Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about something that's really profound and powerful, especially when you dig deep into the reality of the kind of reality that it can create for you, and you may not even be aware of it yet. We're going to be talking about the book, The Emotion Code, and our guest today joining us here on the program is a very well-renowned healer and practitioner for people around the world. And His book is The Emotion Code, and I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program our guest, Dr. Bradley Nelson. Dr. Nelson, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to be here. This is, you know, we've touched on this here and there throughout the program off and on over the years, but it's really profound to realize a lot of times as you get to the nuts and bolts of things, why we a lot of times do the things we do without even being aware of it and then sort of put rational reasons over the fact that we've done what we've done, even as unreasonable as it is. How did you get started with all this? (laughs) Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, it um, it really goes back. Um, it really goes back quite a ways. When I was uh, when I was 13 years old, I developed kidney disease, and uh, it was uh, it was a difficult time for me. I was uh, getting tremendous pains in my kidneys that would put me on the ground at times. And uh, my parents took me to the hospital. They ran these tests, and they said it's uh, it's this disease. There's nothing we can really do for it. He's either going to get better or not. And my folks decided they would try an alternative. So, so they took me to, uh, to get some adjustments from a couple of old-time osteopathic doctors who practiced out on the edge of town um, in, a, uh, in a field on the edge of town in a trailer house. And I remember it would get, uh, get very muddy when it would rain. But they had busloads of people that came to them from different states. And they were really miracle workers. And they told me that I had a... Uh, I had a bone out of alignment in my back and it was uh, interfering with the communication between my brain and my kidneys. And so this disease came along and, and na- it nailed me. Well, within a few weeks uh, after they started working on me, I was feeling better and better. And pretty soon I forgot that I'd ever been sick. And my folks took me back to the clinic and they ran all the tests again. And they said, well, it's a spontaneous remission. You know, it's remarkable. Whatever we did must have worked. And, and of course they hadn't done anything. And I knew then that, um, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be a doctor. And if I needed to practice out on the, uh, on the edge of town in a, in a trailer house in a muddy field, that was okay with me. Uh (laughs) (laughs) So what what ended up happening was as time went on, I ended up uh, going to chiropractic school and I got in the habit of asking for help uh, with every person that I saw, every treatment that I did, I would just, uh, I would ask for a little bit of help from upstairs, from God, um, with that person. And as time went on, there was more and more information that, that flowed down to me. And there were times when uh, someone would come in and they'd have something going on that I didn't know what to do with, and I would utter that silent prayer. And the information would just flow into my mind about what needed to be done for them. And sometimes it was a totally different way of looking at things. And, and so during those years, I was in practice for 17 years, and during those years, I learned that the emotional aspect of our makeup is the elephant in the living room, that our trapped emotions, or what you could refer to as our emotional baggage, is really the single biggest underlying cause of our pain and our diseases and our self-sabotage, our depression, our anxiety, our phobias, our panic attacks. It's all about our emotional baggage. And that emotional baggage that we carry with us eventually manifests somewhere. If you think about it, let's say that you're actually dragging a trunk full of rocks and uh, you drag that down the road. If you drag it long enough, uh, eventually you're going to start to have pain somewhere, probably in your shoulder or someplace, and that's going to be directly as a manifestation of that big trunk of rocks that you're dragging. Well, in the same way, all of us, are dragging around emotional baggage in this, in this energetic sort of way. And the pains and the diseases that we have and our, uh, our emotional difficulties arise as symptoms of this emotional baggage. 
And so it's been a, a really remarkable thing. Uh, and I, I left practice in 2004 and wrote this book, The Emotion Code, to help people understand what this emotional baggage is doing to all of us and at the same time to teach people how they can get rid of their emotional baggage and with it they can get rid of their low back pain or their migraines or their neck pain or their asthma or their infertility. They can get rid of their depression and their phobias and anxiety and panic attacks and they can open their hearts to love where um, maybe they couldn't before. And so it really is the single biggest underlying imbalance and, and underlying cause of all of the maladies that we suffer from. And it's really been, it's really been a remarkable thing to, uh, to have witnessed all of this and to have been there at the, uh, at the birth of this new method, the emotion code, which, by the way, I don't take any credit for. I, uh, I just happened to be there at the right place at the right time and, and really... Um, I believe that um, the emotion code is God's gift to the world at a time when uh, when we really really need it. So, yeah, you can definitely see that you certainly don't try to run with this as though it's something you've developed or created. But one thing I will say for the listeners in the book, the emotion code, without a doubt, uh, Doctor Nelson has done this. He has certainly written this book through what I would call a very strong sense of personal intuition. And that being said, I give you a lot of responsibility for what you have created here to a point that you could almost claim this as your own work. And I say that with a lot of respect, actually, uh, because there is a lot of work out there. And, and you know, and I've been uh, broadcasting for 15 years. Uh, we've been doing Beyond 50 now for more than nine and a half years, and I've talked with just about every guru you can think of on the planet, or self-proclaimed gurus anyway. And you can see where, like a journalist who goes out and journals somebody else's practices, writes a book, you can see, well, you know, that really isn't their work. I want to say that even though, as you just said, I'm not claiming that this is mine, but it's through intuition and practice and implementation you can really claim what you've written here as your own, making this book very authentic for people to use as a very practical tool for healing. Well, thanks, Daniel. I just feel like I'm the um, uh, I'm just the messenger that, uh, for whatever reason, was chosen at this time uh, to bring this into the world. And I, I really honestly feel that... Uh, that all the experiences in my life prepared me to be able to do this, to bring this into the world. And, and yeah, I have no idea why I got picked. I, I sometimes really wonder about that. But, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's how it's been. And, and so it's, it's a fascinating thing. And the, ex- the really exciting thing about this is that um, it's a very empowering process. This is not the kind of process where you pick up the book and the book ends up telling you, well, you need to go and see such and such specialist to have this done. No. On the contrary, this book empowers the individual to help themselves. And, in fact, let me tell you a story. To give you, uh, to give you an illustration of how powerful this can be, there was uh, a woman I was talking to recently who was telling me about her son. She said that um, she bought the Emotion Code book and the book on audio and was listening to it and reading it, and and her son picked it up and started listening and reading. And after a couple of weeks, he started practicing with some of his friends. And a couple of weeks later, the phone rang, and uh, there was a woman on the other end of the line who identified herself as the mother of one of her son's friends. And she said, listen, she said, your son has been doing this emotional thing with some of the boys. And she said, I don't understand what he's really doing. But she said, I have to tell you something. She said, my son has had a phobia of water for many years and we've tried everything to fix it and we've taken him to different people and nothing's ever worked. And she said, right now, he's out swimming in the pool and she said, your son did this to him. She said, I don't understand how he did this. You've got to fill me in. And the amazing thing is both of these little boys, they're really just 11 years old, see. Mm-hmm. So that's the beauty of this. And that's the world that we're, uh, we're moving towards, you see. We're, we're moving towards a world where, uh, where the individual is empowered and where um, the truth of our existence and who we really are and what really affects us and how our emotional baggage really 
uh, is the biggest underlying imbalance that most of us have is really coming to the forefront. And, um, and it's a beautiful time, really, to be alive. I think that um, the Earth, you know, there's, there's been a lot of talk over the last few years about how uh, the Earth is in this transformational phase. And, of course, 2012, a lot of people thought was, you know, was really something to do with that. And, and I think that in, maybe in some way it, it was. I think that we definitely are in a transformational period right now. And the Earth, the whole Earth, I think, is transforming. And a lot of the old constructs are falling away. And the old ways um, of maintaining power and, uh, uh, and of the, the elite being... Um, uh, maintaining their, their power and their control over people, I think is changing. And I think that, I think that uh, this is a perfect illustration of that, how I believe that uh, the birthright of every single person on the planet really is to be a healer. And the emotion code is the simplest way to reclaim and to regain that birthright because it's so simple. It makes energy medicine so simple that even an 11-year-old, an 11-year-old can actually do it. And, um, and that's, uh, that's a beautiful thing. And we, see, we get emails all the time from all, people all over the world whose lives are changing in dramatic ways just by getting rid of their emotional baggage. So mm-hmm. it's a pretty exciting thing to be involved with. <laughs> I think what's fascinating, too, about as you talk about this emergence of uh, personal responsibility is that we're also coming to a place where we can get to a point where we can count on ourselves again, where we believe that we can, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And you take a look at history, especially over the last hundred years with the rise of industrialization, where, for instance, you go to work, you you earn your money, you come home, your boss has told you everything you need to do, you know, you pay your bills, you have a little bit of recreation, and you do all this in a constant cycle until the point of retirement or the machinery of yourself breaks down and and then somebody replaces you. And in the meantime, you know, there have always been people out there telling you what to do, how to do, so forth, uh, to a point that you kind of lose your personal identity. And, you know, proof of this or sort of the ripple effect of this is you take a look at, for instance, YouTube, uh, which is a marvelous, in fact, it's the second highest search tool on the Internet, Mm-hmm. And most queries from people are about how to do things. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you think some of the things these people are looking to go and how do I do this, you know, forgive me for saying so, are some of the stupidest things, but you get to a point you just can't count on yourself to make just decisions, let alone good decisions. And so you look at all of these systems, as you were suggesting earlier, that have set us up to go in that direction. You've got school. Watch out. You make that decision. You make a mistake. You're going to get, you know, a, a failing grade, or you're going to get punished. Or like me, you know, spend a lot of time getting to know each of your principals in each school that you transfer to. You know, mm-hmm. and you get to a point that you can't count on yourself, but yet we still applaud, celebrate, and loft these people who were willing to break through of these things uh, to be able to become these self-identified experts, realizing that, geez, these guys made a lot of mistakes, so which is it? You know, mistakes are good or mistakes are bad? I don't know. I'm confused. And you can see through a lifetime of this, especially starting as children, trapping this and not knowing how do I let this flow and come in and out of me and just keep moving forward, how can cause a lot of the problems that we have as adults? Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, I think that um, one of the basic understandings of the emotion code that, um, that is so critical is that we are beings of pure energy, and mm-hmm. when we're feeling an emotion, what we're really feeling is a certain frequency of energy. If we're feeling anger, that's a certain frequency. That's different from grief, and that's different from frustration and so on. And so it's during those times that we're feeling those emotions intensely that the energy of that gets stuck in our bodies. And yes, definitely that affects us down the road. And actually, what's been fascinating to me is to learn how these things affect us really on two different levels. Initially, Daniel, when I first started doing this and releasing these trapped emotions, it was purely for the physical effect that it would have because it would release people's pain. It didn't take long before 
people came back to me and they would report um, things like, well, for example, I remember very well a man who came into me with low back pain. It was quite severe. We found a trapped emotion of anger that was actually lodged in his low back. Now, trapped emotion, for your listeners, is a, a ball of energy, literally, from about mm-hmm. the size of a baseball to about the size of a cantaloupe. And wherever it lodges, it will distort the normal energy field of the body. And so this particular man had this trapped emotion of anger in his low back. So we cleared it, and the pain instantly uh, disappeared almost completely. And a couple of days later, he came back in, and he said, you know, um, he said, my back is feeling phenomenal. I can't believe it's, that my pain's gone. But he said, something else has happened to me that I need you to explain to me. He said, for a long time, the longest time, as long as I can remember, I've had a hair trigger temper. And I really kind of had an anger problem. And uh, I'm always you know, yelling at my wife or my kids. And I'm always kind of on the verge of losing my temper. And he said, since you released that emotion from me, I just don't feel that anymore. I just feel kind of relaxed and peaceful. And said, how did you, how did you do that? And at the time, uh, early on, at that point, I, I said, well, I really have no idea. I was <laughs> I surprised didn't you didn't say ancient <laughs> Chinese secret. <laughs> yeah. I, I probably should have said something like that. But now I realize what's going on. See, these trapped emotions affect us in these two very discrete ways. They they will, number one, affect us physically because they distort the normal energy field of the body. And really, that's all we are. It's just this very highly organized energy field. And if you distort that energy field, well, you're going to have symptoms uh, eventually. And so that's what was going on with this guy. He had this trapped emotion in his low back, causing the back pain. But when I released the trapped emotion, there was something else that happened to him. His anger left him. And what, it took me a few years to figure this out, but I believe that what goes on is that when we have a trapped emotion, we literally have this ball of vibrational energy that is literally, um, a, in his case, it was a ball of anger, which sounds kind of strange, but I really believe this is how it works. And so when we release that ball of anger from him, that trapped emotion, which literally just takes you know just seconds to release one, it takes about a minute to really find one and then release it for most people, which isn't very long at all. But um, I think that in his case, when a situation would arise where he would tend to feel angry, he would slide right into that emotion, right into that resonance very readily because part of his body was already humming away at that particular frequency, you see. And so this is the real reason. Now, why uh, trapped emotions when they're released, often result in the alleviation of anxiety and depression and all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of emotional tendencies that we don't really want to have. They go away with the release of these trapped emotions. And the way that I look at it is I think that we are, um, we are supposed to be these pure beings of pure energy, But what encumbers us and what clutters up our energy field are all of these trapped emotions, uh, this emotional baggage that we end up picking up during our lifetime. And sometimes we come into the world uh, with emotional baggage from our ancestors too, and we can get rid of that with the emotion code as well. But um, when we release these trapped emotions, it's almost like like unzipping this this, uh, suit that we have gotten into somehow and stepping out of that suit of emotional baggage into this new beingness of who we, who we really are supposed to be, you see. And um, it's a beautiful thing to be able to get rid of the, the baggage that we have because so much of the time, it's like you were saying earlier, so much of the time our lives are kind of misdirected because we're dragging all this baggage and we end up wondering, gee, you know, am I really becoming who I'm supposed to be? Am I really living my life in its fullest and am I achieving everything I could achieve? And the answer for most people is no to those questions because of our emotional baggage. So Mm -hmm. it's great to get rid of. And when you take a look at just that, am I living the life I'm supposed to be living? Now, there's something also that we've addressed here on the program uh, because in your book you talk about the subconscious mind. And this is a place that really pretty much every experience, whether we've consciously realized it or not consciously realized, you know, realized or have this experience is stored. It just doesn't forget anything. 
But consciously, our recall only can recall so much of what we have in the subconscious mind. Now, I can see that as people, you know, listening to this show, they go, well, how do I know what emotions are trapped inside of my body, you know? Uh, Mm -hmm. Is it important for somebody, you know, to know why that's there or just the fact that it is there? And how do you go about sort of unearthing uh, these things and, and helping them to release these emotional trappings? Well, that's a great, great question. And, um, and it's so true what you say, that our conscious minds are really not as smart as we might like to think. Um, if we were really smart, we wouldn't lose our car in the parking lot at uh, mm-hmm. you know, Walmart, and we wouldn't lose our keys and things like that. The subconscious mind, of course, is, um, is a vast intelligence that we really have yet to totally tap into. But I learned, uh, I learned many years ago that the subconscious mind holds all the keys, and it knows what trapped emotions you have. It knows when they occurred. It knows who is involved. It knows what effect they're having on your body. It knows with a perfect understanding uh, everything that needs to be done to take a person from sickness to health. Uh, and... Uh, it's, uh, it's really quite remarkable. So what we do is we use a method. Uh, we use an, actually a number of different methods of muscle testing to tap into the subconscious mind. And, um, and I'll tell you something. You know, I spent, uh, I spent uh, quite a number of years, the majority of, of the years that I was in practice, I was working primarily with people who had been told there was no cure for them, that Western medicine had nothing to offer, and these are people who are suffering from things like chronic fatigue syndrome, where I had patients who were literally sleeping as much as 22 hours a day um, because their fatigue was so bad, and people who had terrible fibromyalgia, pain all over the body, and they'd been told nothing could be done. The subconscious mind knows what the answers are in, mm-hmm. in all of those cases, and, so, and there are a number of different methods of getting to the information, but let me actually share something with your listeners that we call the sway test. Okay. And this, this is a really simple, easy way to tap in to the subconscious mind and to actually get answers. So here's how this works. First of all, if you think about a plant, if you take a potted plant and you put it near a window and you give that plant water every day, but you leave it in the same spot, after maybe a few weeks or a month, you'll notice it's growing towards the light coming in from the window. That's a positive input for that plant. But did you know that studies have been done that show that if you put a plant in front of a speaker that is uh, playing soothing lullabies and uh, beautiful classical type music, that the plant will actually grow towards the speaker. Really interesting. In fact, if you change the music and, uh, and you start blasting harsh, grating, uh, annoying music, uh, acid rock type music, things like that, uh, at that plant, the plant will grow away from the music coming out of the speaker. It will bend away from that speaker. In fact, even the roots themselves will bend away and curve away from that uh, sound. Well, the human body, uh, like a plant, has this innate ability to respond to positive or negative input. And the human body will actually tend to sway forward like a plant growing towards the light. If you're holding on to thoughts of truth or positivity or congruency, the, the body will tend to sway backwards if you're holding on to thoughts of negativity or falsehood or incongruency. Now, we teach a number of different methods of testing and getting information from the subconscious, but this one is the first one that we teach in the Emotion Code book, and most people can do this without any problem. So, uh, so here's how this works, and you can, you can follow along with me and actually try this. So, now, if, you, if you're sitting and you have to sit, then uh, this still does work. We usually do it standing. If you're sitting, just... Uh, uh, just make sure that your back is straight and then it's not touching the back of your seat, okay? And um, if you're standing, just drop your hands down by your side, close your eyes, and totally relax. And just listen to the sound of my voice here for a moment. The first thing that you'll notice is that as you're standing there, totally relaxed, there's always a little tiny bit of movement going on. There's a little bit of oscillation. That's, uh, that's your postural muscles working to keep you from falling over. So you might sway a little bit to the left or right or front or back. That's normal. But what I would like you to do now is I'd like you to actually think about something. Now, we're going to start with something negative and allow your body the chance to respond. I'd like you to think about the word war. Now, that's a word that we hear every day. 
War's been going on on this planet since day one. And, um, but I'd like you to imagine for a moment what really goes on in war. What really happens? If you had to explain to someone from another planet, for example, who had no idea what war meant, uh, what would you say? What, go, what really goes on? Mm-hmm. Now, as you think about that word and what that word entails and what it really truly means at its deepest level, what does it really mean? Mm-hmm. What, what really goes on? The moment that you actually connect with what that word really means, at that same moment, you will start to sway backwards away from the sheer negativity of that thought of the war. Very, very, very negative thing. The worst thing probably that happens on the planet. So that's, that's a negative thing. Let's think about something positive now and see what kind of response your body gives you. I'd like you to think about the word gratitude for a moment. Think about someone in your life, for example, that you're really grateful to. Is there anyone that's ever really done something nice for you or something selfless for you? Or Mm -hmm. are you just grateful to be alive? Uh, If you think about that, think about maybe the people in your life that you love and that you're grateful for. As you feel that feeling of gratitude, as you allow that feeling to fill your heart, that gratitude feeling, what will start to happen is your subconscious mind will start to move you in the direction of that gratitude. Uh, the subconscious mind perceives these thoughts as somehow being, being kind of in front of us, and so you'll tend to sway forward towards thoughts of positivity, like things like gratitude, love, and so on, mm-hmm. and backwards away from things like war. So that's, the, uh, that's what we call the sway test. Now, you can use the sway test to get other answers from the subconscious mind. The subconscious is essentially a computer system. It's the most powerful computer system in the known universe. And uh, we can tap into it by asking questions. As long as the answers are yes or no, we can, uh, we can, get, most, uh, we can get questions answered uh, most of the time. So I'd like you to think about this question. Ask this question now. Um, do I have a heart wall? You might imagine seeing that question in front of you, maybe. Uh, see those letters in the air. Do I have a trapped emotion? Do I have a trapped emotion? Focus on that thought for a moment. Do I have a trapped emotion? And allow your subconscious mind to sway your body forward or backward. Forward indicates yes, I do have a trapped emotion. Backward indicates no, I don't have a trapped emotion. And now I'd like you to ask another question here. This question is, do I have a heart wall? And I'll explain to you what a heart wall is in, in a minute here. But just ask that question, do I have a heart wall? A heart wall is where trapped emotions have become clustered around the heart and interfere with your ability to give and receive love and manifest. Mm-hmm. Do I have a heart wall? Do I have a heart wall? And then allow your body to sway forward or backward. Now, um, and, and let me explain about the heart wall and what that is. For those of you who, uh, who got a yes answer on that one, you're, you're going to want to know. 93% of people have this phenomenon uh, that we refer to as a heart wall. What happens? Well, the subconscious mind, you see, uh, is probably stored in the heart itself. Uh, The ancient peoples believed that the heart, the human heart, was the seat of the soul and the seat of creativity and love and romance and so on. And, of course, in the West, with our mechanistic way of looking at things, we've believed that uh, if we we ever paid any attention to what the ancient peoples believed at all, we just kind of scoffed at those ideas and believed that, uh, well, those were just ancient civilizations that didn't have the technology that we have today. Now we know the heart is really just a mechanical pump, and that's all it is. But what we're finding now with modern technology and new developments, we're finding that it appears that those ancient peoples were exactly right and that the heart was everything that they said it was and and probably more. And that first uh, started to come to the forefront. These understandings started coming up when we started doing heart transplants back in the 1960s because people would come back uh, and they would report that they – had uh, some strange things going on. Sometimes their handwriting would change. 
after their heart transplant. Sometimes they would have memories of places that they had never been, but they would have memories of those places. Mm-hmm. Sometimes their taste in music or in, uh, in uh, sports or food would change dramatically. And in every case where it was, uh, where it was studied, um, the handwriting had changed to the handwriting of the donor, which is a weird thing. Um, and the taste uh, were the taste of the donor, and the memories were the memories of the donor. So somehow the heart is transferring this memory, this cellular memory. Well, when they started to do um, uh, scans of the heart using the magnetocardiogram, which is the, where they can measure very sensitively the heart's magnetic field, they found that the heart's magnetic field extends out around the body up to 12 feet in diameter. Wow. And prob- probably more. And, yes, and listen to the, the most amazing thing is that they found that when one person is feeling love or affection for another person, their heartbeat will actually manifest and be measurable in the brain waves of that other person that they're focusing their love or affection on. Think about that. How about that? Yeah, so there's this communication going on, you see, really, between all of us all the time. There's a heart communication happening with us that we've never really been aware of. And so... Um, so it's, it's a really amazing thing. Well, what happened to me was... Uh, so, I was, uh, just hold on on that thought just for a moment. Sure. And I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think it's really imperative to think. So you can imagine where, and, and I've had this experience, where you're around someone, you, boy, I just feel really good. Or that person gives me, literally, gives me the creeps. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great illustration. I think that we... I think that we have this knowingness um, about other people. We can sense things about other people, and now we're starting to understand maybe part of the mechanism for that, see, because their heart energy is getting into our brain somehow, and um, it's, it's a really wild thing. Well, anyway, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the heart myself, but one day uh, I had a really amazing thing that happened. I was, uh, I was actually in Portland. You're in Portland, right? Right, Portland, Oregon. Yeah, I was in Portland uh, for a conference on magnetic healing. This was back in 1998, and uh, I was one of the speakers at this conference. And I took my wife with me, and she woke me up early on the morning of this conference, and she said that she'd had a dream. And in her dream, she, thought, she saw three symbols that she knew had to do with her own health and well-being. And she asked me if I would help her to figure out what this dream meant. And so I said, okay, that I would. And um, as I was in the middle of trying to help her, decipher her dream, I suddenly had what I can only describe to you as a waking vision where, and I've never had, I had never had anything like this happen before. I've never had anything like this happen since. But at that moment, suddenly before me, I saw this beautiful hardwood floor. And it was right in front of me. And I didn't imagine this. Suddenly it was just there. Mm -hmm. And I could see it in great detail. It was just an incredible thing. And uh, the most beautiful floor I've ever seen in my life. It looked like it had 100 coats of polish. It was absolutely just, just beautiful. But at the same time that I'm seeing this floor, I have this understanding in my mind that my wife's heart is underneath this floor. Mm. Now, I had absolutely no idea what this meant, um, but this, this understanding and this vision persisted for probably three or four minutes. And I told my wife what I was seeing and understanding, and she had no idea what it meant either. And so we prayed and asked God to help us figure it out. And we started doing some testing of her subconscious. And it didn't take us too long. Within about a half an hour, we figured out what was going on. Uh, She was born into a very volatile family. Her father was a rageaholic, and the whole family was constantly walking on pins and needles. I mean, for years, the whole time she was growing up. No one ever knew when dad was going to blow up. No one knew who he was going to blow up at. It was just very, uh, very unsafe. Well, what happened to her was by the time she was two years old, she had felt like her little heart was going to break often enough that uh, she needed to put up a wall around that heart. Mm-hmm. Now, those feelings that we call heartache or when we feel like our heart is going to break, uh, we, the vast majority of us have had that kind of sensation uh, at some point in our lives. And it's a physical sensation, and you literally feel like someone's sitting on your chest or like you can't breathe and so on. Well, what's going on there is that that heart, which really is the core of your being, is under assault, you see, 
And so if that happens more than once or twice, the subconscious will start to put up a wall around the heart to protect that core of your being. And that wall, we found, literally made from the energy of the emotional experiences that had gotten stuck in her body, her trapped emotions. Mm. And so we started working on her and releasing these trapped emotions. Now, the price that she had paid for having this wall around her heart was it, her heart was protected, but uh, and so she was able to go through all those years in her family in that very dysfunctional environment. But the price that she paid was that she always felt kind of isolated. She, even the people that she had been with, uh, that she'd known for years, she kind of always felt like she was on the outside looking in, like she was kind of expendable. And um, it was easy for her to feel negative emotions, hard to feel positive ones. She suffered from depression and anxiety and so on. And when we finally released that last emotion, making up that wall, uh, suddenly she had this sense of belonging for the first time that she could remember. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, things started to really change in dramatic ways for her. So she was the first person that uh, that we, we found this on. And at first I thought that she might be the only person that had this weird thing because she, she's had a lot of weird things that, uh, that I think she was given so that I could fix, right? That's kind of how things work. <laughs> your wife wasn't coming into your life to be loved. She was coming in to be healed, and you were the only one capable. <laughs> she's complained many times of being a guinea pig. So. But anyway, um, at the very beginning, I thought maybe this was unique to her. But Mm -hmm. then, uh, of course, since then we found that 93% of people have this phenomenon, this heart wall going on. Wow. And one of my favorite stories that's actually in the Emotion Code book is uh, uh, one one of the next people that I worked on, actually, after that was a young woman, 38 years old, came to me because she had uh, neck pain. And she'd seen several doctors for this neck pain, and, and they hadn't been able to fix it. So she came to me. And as I was talking with her, she was telling me, I remember, that uh, she was single and she was planning on staying single. She was basically celibate, really. She was going to stay single the rest of her life, was never going to date again, was never going to be in a relationship again. And she hadn't dated in eight years. And she was an attractive woman. And I said, well, what happened to you? And she said eight years before, she was really deeply in love with this guy who just really just broke her heart. Mm -hmm. And and so I checked her, and as you might imagine, she had a heart wall. Now, before this event, eight years before, she didn't have a heart wall. But that breakup, those intense emotions, that deep grief and sadness, that's what created that wall around her heart. There were three emotions uh, that were creating this wall. Now, you can think of a heart wall as actually being like a like a a force field. It's an energy wall that is created around the heart. So we cleared those three emotions. And I hadn't touched her neck, by the way, at that point. And and she suddenly said her neck felt better and her pain was gone. Well, she left the office and I didn't see her again for three months. When she came back, uh, and I remember this like it was yesterday, she looked great and I said, hey, how are you? What's, What's going on? And she said, well, since I was here, my neck's been fine. But she said, you know, you released that heart wall from me. And that really works because she said, about two weeks after I was here, I found out my childhood sweetheart's been living right around the corner from me for almost eight years and wow. dating and in love. And I think he's going to ask me to marry him. You know, huge transformation. And, and so that was, uh, that was really a tremendously powerful introduction for me of what this heart wall does. Now think about it. Here's a woman who's going to stay celibate the rest of her life and gets her heart wall removed and suddenly finds out her childhood sweetheart's been living right around the corner. Why didn't she run into him during all those previous eight years? Well, because her heart wasn't open to that, see? Mm -hmm. And so suddenly when that heart wall was taken down, then suddenly things started happening for her. And I have seen this kind of thing happen over and over and over again. And that's really, see, Daniel, that's the power. That's what's really driving the emotion code is these kinds of results that people are getting and a lot of the time they're getting them on their own. They're just releasing their own trapped emotions. They're getting rid of their own heart wall. And then things are starting to transform for them. And um, so it's it's really, really a lot of fun. I can imagine it would be. And you take a look at the fact that we have this huge industry that's been around for years in self-help, you know, manifesting and creating, and it goes on and on. 
And so people buy these books or they attend these seminars or they listen to CDs that tell them again, how do I do this? <laughs> these are all things you're capable of doing if you just kind of go to trust yourself, but they don't. Mm -hmm. But then they follow these steps and then they find themselves, you know, maybe slightly better off at best, but for the most part in the same place that they were when they started, or in some cases, even worse, and going, I, why isn't this working for me? And that yeah. sense of frustration that comes in with this, but yet you go back in time, you know, back in the days even Napoleon Hill and even before that, it's an interesting little uh, group known as, I guess it's uh, New Thought. This goes back to the 1800s, and it talks a lot about what you're discussing here today, so from within, so without, and they talk about how this positive energy within you that when you get it to that vibration all things not only happen but they happen easily and almost effortlessly you yeah. know that the truth yeah. is you even go back to biblical times and i've even brought this up on the program i'm not christian but the teachings of christ were pretty fascinating because it was a time also that he's saying hey look i'm going to teach you how to manifest miracles this isn't just something that occurs occasionally. It doesn't just occur from, you know, just these unique individuals. These are real things that not only should be happening regularly, but should be a habit of all things. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, when you take a look at what you're describing here about this heart wall, and you take a look at these teachings, they come from that source, the idea of opening your heart, the idea of compassion, that Forgiveness is one of these so-called magic wands that helps you to release these things that you've been holding trapped for so long that have been repelling all of these things that you want to move toward that you desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Does true. Does that make sense? I mean, have you had yeah. that experience as you've worked with people? Oh, absolutely. You know, what I believe is that every single person uh, has within their own heart their perfect creation in this life. And it's different for every single person. Of course. And the beauty of, the beauty of taking down that heart wall is that then that creation that's in the heart simply starts to manifest. And, um, and that's really the biggest thing that's in our way. And I've thought about this many times and I've, and I've talked about it many times as well. You're absolutely right. I mean, you think of all the money that people spend on all the positive programs and how to get ahead and how to get well or how to get... Uh, how to become financially successful and how to have abundance and manifest. The reality of it is your own abundance lies within your heart and it can absolutely manifest effortlessly for you if you can take down that wall. Mm -hmm. And we see this happen all the time for people and there's no greater example, I think, than people who, uh, who could not find love Mm -hmm. What's more important than that? What do we want more than that, really? If we, if we have love, that's the most important thing, I think. And, and we see this all the time happening. In fact, I was talking with somebody recently who was telling me that uh, her sister had been divorced for nine years and just really didn't know where to begin. And uh, no one ever called her. And uh, she'd like to date but didn't really know how to go about it. And her, her sister worked on it. found she had a heart wall, cleared her heart wall. And the week after that, the phone started to ring. Guys started to call. She hadn't put anything out anywhere on Facebook or anything like that, but the energy goes out from the individual, and then things start to happen. Uh, I was talking with one of our practitioners recently who told me that um, in January she took on um, three new clients among her other clients that were – these three new uh, people were all single women who wanted to be in a relationship but weren't, and so she found that all three of them had a heart wall. She was able to take down the heart wall from each of them. By Valentine's Day, all three of them were in love. All three were in a relationship. You know? So mm -hmm. I mean, what's better than that? <laughs> so what do you think we should do about Kim Kardashian? <laughs> oh, you know, I really don't watch TV much. I prefer, but I don't, I don't know. She's, She's pretty, pretty much everywhere you go, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> she was the one, I don't know if you're familiar, but I know a lot of our listeners must be, you know, but she was in that marriage for 72 days, got married just after 
Prince William and, and Kate, you know, so that was supposedly America's royal wedding of all things. And oh. then uh, 72 days later, asking for divorce and, you know, people feeling in it. It goes on and on and on. I mean, she's just, you know, kind of another one of them Hollywood wrecks, you know, where the emotions and everything seem to be out on the sleeve. But what's fascinating about that is this, is that you see these tabloids that sit at the check stands, and, and again, you have the reality TV and I believe that a lot of times that we voyeuristically uh, sort of co-participate in this because it's a way that we think we're working out our own stuff. Otherwise, we wouldn't be drawn to it. And I guess mm-hmm. that being Probably said, true. what is a good way that a person listening right now can start to begin, uh, besides getting your book, uh, The Emotion Code, uh, to kind of unlock these stored and trapped feelings. And, and the other thing I wanted to know, too, is does it go in layers, or can you kind of release all of it at once? How does that work? Well, it would be really nice if we could release all of it at once. So um, dump the trunk, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, we've tried to figure out how to do that for many years, but, um, but it, the answer that we get consistently is that these things need to be released one at a time, mm-hmm. and so it does. It is a little bit of a process. It does take some time to do, but um, but it's very very worth it. And um, and in fact, uh, you know what? Uh, one of the things that I recommend for people is that um, if uh, if for example you're in pain, you need to realize that uh, there's about a ninety percent probability that that pain is due to a trapped emotion. And in the Emotion Code book, you can learn this simple method of finding and releasing that trapped emotion and getting rid of it. In fact, um, there's a, uh, in fact, I set up some new videos at a, at a, uh, a website that your listeners might be interested in. It's called um, emotioncode.tv. Emotioncode.tv. Okay. And there's, it's a series of videos where I actually will take you through this process of releasing a trapped emotion. And um, uh, four four videos, and I kind of explain the whole process, and then we, we actually help you to release a trapped emotion yourself, and I teach you how to do it. So that's a great resource to go to for that. And um, so, so yes, it's, it's a simple process, um, and it's as simple as it can be. I've always liked what Einstein said. He said, um, things should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. <laughs> now I do know though in your book you talk about other ways that you can uh, release trapped emotions and what I was intrigued about mm-hmm. was uh, the use of magnets even to the point where you could use a refrigerator magnet now talk about mm-hmm. this for, you know, what's that all about well sure what happens is um, uh, these trapped emotions of course are energies in the body and what we do is we, we fight fire with fire. Um, mm-hmm. Magnets, of course, are just a, a really common form of energy, magnetic energy. Just about everybody has some kind of a magnet in their house. And what we have found, initially we thought that uh, you had to use high-end, expensive magnets specifically designed for healing. And uh, since then, what, uh, what we've learned is that any magnet will work. In fact, if you don't have a magnet, you can even use your own fingertips because the fingertips themselves are, are magnetic. The whole body, of course, is magnetic, and that also works. But if you've got a refrigerator magnet, that can be the most powerful healing device in your whole house. Believe it or not, that sounds funny, but I'm telling you, um, uh, when you, when you use a refrigerator magnet to release a trapped emotion, and by the way, uh, to release a trapped emotion, what we do is we have this simple process that we go through we simply ask questions and get some answers from the subconscious mind. We have a list of emotions, and it's broken into columns and rows. And so you simply ask questions and get answers. And very quickly, the body will take you right to that emotion. And, uh, and then you can release that emotion. And what you do is you simply, uh, uh, if you're releasing it on yourself, you uh, would take, for example, a magnet or your fingertips, and you just pass uh, from your forehead you just go over the top of your head to the back of your neck three times to release a trapped emotion. Or um, if it's an inherited emotion, which we, we get those at the moment of conception sometimes. Mm-hmm. And those came from mom or dad, and they might have gotten them when they were conceived from their mom or dad. Sometimes these can go back for a number of generations. 
uh, we, we will pass the magnets or the fingertips over that governing meridian uh, 10 times. The governing meridian is a little energy river that starts at the upper lip and goes straight up the forehead and over the top of the head and all the way down the back to the tailbone. And so, and this is all outlined in detail in the book and in the videos at emotioncode.tv as well. So it's actually a really simple process. And um, in fact, uh, I've taught seminars all over the world on this. And uh, uh, on, on many occasions, people have come up to me and, and they've said, you know, Dr. Nelson, this just, seems, this just seems too simple. And my response to them has always been, well, I could make it more difficult. For you, <laughs> but why? That's some of that subliminal training we've received over the years. That I'm the expert. I'm going to keep it as complicated as I can, so you have, you know, sort of the desire, the need to come and see me over and over and spend your money, so to speak. <laughs> well, right. And you know, that's a fascinating thing too. I noticed um, during all those years that I was uh, practicing, I noticed that that. Um, there were healing methods that would come up that would be really great and very simple in the beginning. But what I saw was when the doctor's ego got involved, then they invariably became more and more and more complicated to a point where you had to have some kind of, you need to be a rocket scientist to do right. these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, no, I'm, I'm a great lover of simplicity and, uh, and the emotion code is as simple as it can get, but no simpler. <laughs> now, here's something that, that I'm sure our listeners are wondering now. Uh, when you come to remove these blocked emotions, one of the things you just suggested is some of these trapped emotions may have come to us prenatally. I mean, when we were in our mother's womb that we took mm -hmm. this on. Our mm -hmm. own parents might have had the same thing happen as well, so it could go back generations and even in the suggestion of past lives and our experiences then for those who may ascribe to those particular realities. But the fact is that you have layers of this going on. So I guess a person might think, if I get in there and I start you know, digging these out and releasing them, how soon do I usually see, you know, I guess, the positive changes in my life? Well, you know, um, positive changes. I'm sure changes, it's different for everybody, but for the most mm -hmm. part, you know, what does that look like? Well, um, you know, it's different for everybody. Most people experience positive changes right away. Um, sometimes positive changes occur over a little bit of a longer period of time. Let me share a story with you. Uh, this is a true story uh, that, uh, that actually happened to me. Uh, one of the unique things about the emotion code is that um, it's usually done at a distance. It can certainly be done in person, mm -hmm. but it's usually, uh, usually done at a distance. And we have uh, almost 1,000 practitioners now that we've certified worldwide, and most of them work with other people in other countries and so on. And, um, and it's a beautiful thing. Well, one day I asked my daughter to work on me, and uh, uh, she was about 1,500 miles away. So she started working on me. And she found that I had uh, an inherited emotion of hopelessness. And she started to trace this back, and it had come to me from my father at the moment of conception. And he had gotten it when he was conceived from his mother. And she would gotten it from her mother. And it went all the way back. It went back 22 generations, which is quite a ways for one of these. Usually they go back two or three. 22 generations to a grandmother of mine that we think probably lived in Ireland in the 1500s. Now, when my daughter arrived at this, she suddenly felt the presence of this grandmother standing. She could feel her standing right next to her, and she could feel her emotions. She could feel how desperate she was to have this emotional baggage released from her posterity. It's what she had passed on to her posterity was this this intense emotion of hopelessness. And of course, we have no idea you know, what went on with her, but um, no way to know that. But I'm sure living in the 1500s wasn't easy at any rate. Mm. And she could also feel her overwhelming feeling of gratitude, that she was so grateful that this was being released. Well, so she released that emotion. And when we release a trapped emotion like this that's inherited, it releases not only from the person that you're releasing it on, but it also releases from all of those ancestors all the way back, however far back it goes. And she could feel that, that emotion ripple through and release from all those intervening grandmothers, including my dad. Well, here I am 1,500 miles away. 
and she's working on me. And I knew and comprehended the moment that that emotion was released because all my life uh, I have struggled with that emotion to some degree of hopelessness. And, and in fact, this was a couple of years after I'd written the Emotion Code book. And when I was writing the book, it was one of the hardest things I ever did because I'd have to psych myself up for half an hour to an hour um, every day when I would start to write because otherwise I just I couldn't do it. I had to overcome this hopelessness. And it's hard to describe what happened, but it, if you lived next door to a factory that was running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and there was a continual hum coming out of that factory, after a month or two, you would you'd just block it out. You wouldn't even notice it. Right. And when she released that inherited emotion of hopelessness from me, it suddenly turned off, and in that moment, I understood it and comprehended it, and I, I said to myself, my gosh, I've had that all these years. I never even knew that it was there because it was so background, and suddenly it was released. And that was one of the most profound healings that I've had in my life, and it was actually inherited uh, from 22 generations back. Now, my daughter actually had inherited the same emotion from me. And here's what happened with her. She was in the first year of her marriage and was miserable. Should have been happy, was miserable. She was a very frustrated artist but couldn't seem to do any artwork because she couldn't seem to paint or do anything because she just felt hopeless about it. Um, within a year, she had a showing in Seattle of her artwork. It suddenly started just flowing out of her. Um, her marriage totally turned around, became a very happy marriage. So there's all kinds of great things, um, all kinds of great results that can happen when you start getting rid of these trapped emotions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I know that there was some time ago I was talking with someone who was a, I guess, call it family, uh, what do they call that, family constellation practitioner. And she brought up something that to me kind of really hit me as profound, uh, Part of my ancestry is Native American Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And I always had this feeling that when things were going well, that all of a sudden something would just kind of screw up and take all that away. And she says, well, take a look at your ancestry, at least uh, from that part of your bloodline, is that here was the Native American yeah. who was on his land, and these people, these European white settlers, just simply came and took their land and their identity away. Yeah. You know, it stands to reason that you would be feeling this way. Oh, yeah. And so when you talk about what you're talking about, you know, you have to say, you know, as much as maybe the so-called mainstream society looks at this as a bunch of hippie woo-woo stuff, there's got to be a lot of reality behind this because <laughs> it just makes uh, a lot of sense. Oh, absolutely. It's real. I mean, we can live in denial of... Uh of the emotional baggage that we are dragging around from our ancestors, but it's so much better to just get rid of it. And exactly. Freeing. <laughs> Claim your life and set up a whole new ancestry, if you will. <laughs> well, and the beauty of it, you know, is that with the emotion code, it's easy to find these inherited emotions and easy to get rid of them, but we're not only freeing ourselves, we're also freeing them in some way. They're, they're still around. They're still our ancestors. I believe we'll be connected to them eternally. And I happen to think personally that they're our guardian angels uh, who would be more interested in us than them. So they're, you know, they're the ones that uh, mm -hmm. whisper to us about danger and give us information and so on. And so releasing them from their baggage is a beautiful thing. Now, Dr. Uh, uh, Nelson, if you could for our listeners, because we're just about out of time, what is a couple of websites people can find out more about how to get the book? And, of course, you were mentioning the TV one as well. Absolutely. Well, you can go to um, drbradleynelson.com. That's D-R-B-R-A-D-L-E-Y-N-E-L-S-O-N.com. There's a lot of great basic information there. Uh, if you want more advanced information uh, about perhaps becoming a, or a practitioner in the emotion code, you can go to healerslibrary.com. That's H-E-A-L-E-R-S, library.com, healerslibrary.com. And then the other site that I mentioned, if you want to uh, uh, have some instructional videos where I teach you more about this and actually help you to release a trapped emotion um, on video, you can go to emotioncode.tv. Very good. The book is The Emotion Code. Our guest today, Dr. Bradley Nelson. Dr. Nelson, thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. Thank you, Daniel. It's really been fun. Hold on. 
We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to visit us at beyond50radio.blogspot.com where you can find out the most recent updates, including a hot post for the emotion code as well, to find out more about how you can release these trapped emotions and have that life that you really desire and yearn for. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio show. And remember, live your day past halfway.